Good morning. The time is now 9.30 and a quorum of the board is present. The State Board of Education meeting of June 13, 2017 is called to order. Approval of the agenda and order of priority. Is there a motion on the agenda? Lupe? I, I'm, I would like to uh, move that we uh, delete. Remove the State Board of Ed bylaw change. Yes, yes. What, what number is that? Item P. Yes. It's been moved. Is there support? Support. It's been moved and supported to remove item P. Any comments or questions? Seeing none, all in favor in removing P, say aye. 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 Opposed the same. Motion carries. Is there a motion on the amended agenda? So moved. Second. It's been moved and supported to move forward with the agenda as amended. Is there any questions or comments? Seeing none, all in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed the same. Motion carries. There is an informational folder item, uh, information on the Michigan Mathematics and Science Center Network 2015-16 annual report. No action is needed, but you do have that in front of you. At this time, Marilyn will introduce the members of the State Board of Education. Marilyn, please. Good morning. The State Superintendent, Brian Whiston, is on my immediate left. He's also chairman of the board. And as we go around the table clockwise, the co-president of the board is Richard Ziley. He resides in Dearborn. The other co-president of the board is Cassandra Albrich, residing in Rochester Hills. Board secretary, Michelle Fecto, residing in Detroit. The NASB delegate, which is the board's association, National Association of State Boards of Education, is Nikki Snyder from Dexter. The current teacher of the year is Tracy Hordisky, and she's a teacher in Kennewa Hills when she's not here. As we go across the table, representing the governor's office, the strategic education and career development advisor is Tyler Sawyer. Next to him is Eileen Weiser. She's a board member residing in Ann Arbor. She is very close on her way. And Lupe Ramos Montini, board member residing in Grand Rapids uh, and also on her way. Pamela Pugh, board member residing in Saginaw. And next to me is the board's treasurer, Tom McMillan from Rochester Hills. I'm Marilyn Schneider, the state board executive. And as you did those introductions, I did want to mention that uh, uh, Lupe received an honorary doctorate degree from Midwest College of Theology. So congratulations, Lupe. Thank you. With that, we'd like to introduce new employees. Vanessa, please. Division of Educator, Student, School Supports. And the first is Elaine Thumb from the Office of Student Services. You just say hi. Hi. <laughs> 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 my name is Elaine Thumb. I'm the Test Security Specialist looking at assessment accountability. And um, my background is as a, a high school teacher. I also worked with uh, charter schools and overseeing their assessment accountability. And as an adjunct instructor of history. Thank you. And next we have Lisa Francisco from Office of Field Services. Good morning, um, Lisa Francisco, Early Literacy, Multi-Tiered Systems of Support Consultant for Office of Field Services, um, mostly with 31A funding. I am fresh from the field, 23 years as an elementary school principal from a high performance school in Mason, and I've also been in the parochial schools as an administrator and teacher. I'm glad to be here and be of support. And last but not least, Stephanie Holmes-Webster from Office of Field Services as well. Good morning, everyone. My name is Stephanie Holmes-Webster. I come to you with 16 years of education experience. K through 12 as a teacher, district administrator, and also as a comprehensive reform model consultant across the United States. I'm glad to be here to help with the Office of Field Service and Special Populations. Did I miss any other new employees in the room? All right, let's welcome the new employees. <laughs> now I'd like to have audience members uh, introduce yourself. We'll start with Marty, please. <coughs> Hi, I'm Marty Ackley. I'm the director in the Office of Public and Governmental Affairs here in the Department of Education. Hi, I'm Chelsea Martinez, director of communications at the Secondary School Principals Association. Judy Pritchett, Macomb Intermediate School District. Oh, go ahead, on the side here. No, that's fine. Uh, my name is Bill Edwards. I'm here to support Dave Stewart today. Very good. I'm Dave Stewart. I'm here to support <laughs> Dave Stewart. <laughs> ah, wait a minute. How's that happen? I'm Bill Edwards, and I'm Dave Stewart's mother in law. Very good. Front row, then? I'm Gina Wilson, the finalist for the MSA competition. Dave Stewart, Jr., finalist. 
graveyard finals for each year teacher of the year? Luke Wilcox, teacher at East Campbell High School. Uh, Jim Wilcox, Bob Wilcox. Paul Bottrell, Bob Carol Bottrell, mother-in-law of Luke Wilcox. What's your name? My name's Jamie Wilcox. I'm a teacher in Northview and also Luke's wife. Oh my God, no. I'm Jamie Gordon, assistant principal at East Campbell High School. The same color here. Kevin Borday from the public schools support group. Michael Mohawk from the public schools support group. Omar Bakery, principal of East Kenwood High School, here support group as well. Nard Murphy, I'm superintendent of Williamson Community Schools, and I'm here to support Ray here. Dr. Jeff Pants, principal of Williamson High, here to support Ray. Nancy Jaskew, executive board member of the special advisory team. Hi, I'm Kim Serini, the principal at Fitzgerald High School, here to support Todd for Craft. Cheryl Corpus, an associate director with the Education Trust, here to support you all. My name is Ellen Fisher, and I'm the principal of the Early College Alliance at Eastern Michigan University, and I'm here to support Gina Wilson. Back there in the corner, please. I'm Josh Friesner at the Office of Educator Talent. I'm the Michigan Teacher of the Year Coordinator. Shelby Lee with the Office of Educator Talent. Jennifer Robel, Office of Educator Talent. Angie Herrick, um, wife of Ray Herrick. Drew Ann Herrick, mother of finalist. Ray Herrick, father of the finalist, Ray Herrick. <laughs> Barbara Kendall, mother of Jennifer Crotty. And Bill Kendall, father of Jennifer Crotty. I'm Brian McVicker with MLive.com. Caroline Lincoln, Office of Public and Governmental Affairs. I'm Abby Groff Blazak. I'm the Director of the Office of Educator Talent. Stephen Mask with the Office of Strategic Planning and Implementation. Kyle Ron, Deputy Superintendent for Finance Operations here at the Michigan Department of Education. Vanessa Kiesler, Deputy Superintendent for the Division of Educator Student School Sports. Susan Gerland, Deputy Superintendent, Lead for Point Systems and Student Transition. Good morning. I'm Wendy Larvick, Chief of Staff to State Superintendent Brian Wilson. Well, welcome to all. Thank you for being here today. It's a great day of celebration of our great teachers, and we appreciate everybody being here. Mm -hmm. If you plan to offer public comment at today's meeting, please complete a form and get it to Maryland. Forms are available at the table just outside of the boardroom, and they must be submitted prior to the beginning of the portion of the meeting devoted to public comment. Public comment will begin immediately following the lunch break, which is scheduled for approximately 1 p.m. today. Please be here at that time so that you don't miss the opportunity to, to address your issues to the board. We now move to consent agenda. We have two resolutions that require approval before we move to the presentations. The first one is honoring Tracy Hordisky, 2016-17 Michigan Teacher of the Year. The other, the other is honoring Luke Wilcox, the 17-18 Teacher of the Year, and I will entertain a motion. So moved. Support. Support. Mood supported. Any comments or questions? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. Motion carries. So now we'd like to introduce Tracy Hordisky, the 2016-17 Michigan Teacher of the Year. This is Tracy's final meeting. I can't believe a year has gone by. I, it seems like you just got here. She's been a valuable resource at the board table as well as uh, discussions on at the table and at other places. And She's done countless visits around the state, uh, looking at the good things that are going on and sharing that. We certainly appreciate your passion, your advocacy for teachers, and certainly want to congratulate you and want you to give your final Teacher of the Year report. All right, sounds good. I just have some snapshots here of some different visits throughout the year and some of these are colleagues of mine some of them are student teachers our future teachers 
Um, <coughs> the one with the bright colors is there. The, is that the Cesar Chavez social justice activities that I get to participate in with um, Dr. Lupe Ramos <laughs> and uh, <laughs> some of them are when I'm dressed up in character um, with students there in the middle. There's Carol the communicator. Um, former students that I ran into from Kenowa Hills who were becoming teachers that I got to speak to. Some of my mentors who happened to be different places where I was able to present. Um, but all in all, there were many experiences that I was able to participate in that um, shaped this year. And um, while this is the end of this year, I view it kind of as a commencement um, where we think about it only as the beginning. Um, because with the number of presentations, I've got them listed here. I've got 15 school visits, 27 speeches or presentations, 57 professional learning opportunities that I either facilitated or participated in, and more than 90 meetings with fellow educators or others interested in education across the state, across the country, um, also working through the National Board Certification process and working with students um, and all those spare moments that I had um, in between all those other obligations and thinking about how I want to apply all of this learning that I've had because it, it has felt like I've learned as much in the past 12 months as I have in probably the past 12 years. Um, and it's hard to capture all of that in a moment where you have just a few minutes to share. And one of the things that I know is, is sharing story is probably one of the most pow powerful ways to go about doing that. So I just wanna briefly share a story about Caesar, who is a student, and I don't know if you recall the Proud Michigan Educator uh, kickoff video, and Caesar was featured in that because he was a student of mine in reading intervention last year. And through National Board, the, that process, um, I had the opportunity to work with him again. And something that I had noticed was how he behaved differently um, within the, the context of the whole entire class as opposed to when I had him in a small group. And he kept talking about how he did not like poetry. He was very fond of nonfiction and he loved animals, but he did not want to do, have anything to do with that. And that was the reading unit that they were focused on. So I thought, ah, that's my mission. Because poetry can be that segue into understanding um, our social, our, our emotional selves. And it also is how we play around with language. And so as a writer, we need to be able to think flexibly with that. Um, and so I thought, okay, this is what we're gonna work through. And I, and I found a poem called Bilingual because he's very proud of his Hispanic heritage. And I wanted to foster that because it's something he kind of kept to himself in the classroom. And he didn't speak Spanish to the other students except for when they were in Spanish class. And then he said, oh, they bother me because they always want me to say words. <laughs> um, so with this, I, I, I shared a poem with him called Bilingual. And it, I had him engage in a see, think, wonder strategy, which is a visible, uh, making thinking visible strategy um, out of uh, Project Zero out of Harvard. And with that, he, um, we, we set it up like nonfiction because that's what he loved, that's what his strength was. So he had the heading, See, Think and Wonder. And then he did some rereadings of this poem. And one of our guiding questions was always, how does fluency influence our understanding of the text? So he was always aware and self-evaluating where he was fluency-wise so that he could think about with each consecutive reading, how am I understanding this better? And so as he was recording his thoughts, what he was seeing, thinking or wondering, as he's rereading this poem, he had several questions. Most of them were these wonderings about the father, um, you know, why, why does he feel this way? And I don't understand what this means. And he goes, see, this is why I don't get it, why I don't like it. And I said, just keep rereading. And he found that he actually was able to answer his own questions the more he continued to reread re the text. And so the look on his face. And so then he started to describe the emotions that he, he was experiencing through the characters. And he was looking at one of those Jim Borgman, how are you feeling today posters. And he's picking out the emotions of the daughter and the father in this poem. 
And as he's doing this, he's playing around the syllables in those words. And I'm like, I think you have the start of a haiku here. So he's like, okay. So he starts writing this haiku poem. So I have those to share with you here. So this, this is his poem, so, and poems should be read aloud, so I will read them aloud to you. Daughter's feeling, lonely, guilty, sad. The mind can't divide the heart. The heart is still one. Father's feeling, I love my daughter. When she's near me, I am happy. I fear the harsh world. Pretty profound for a third grader. Um, and given the complexity of this text, um, of, of this idea that the, the father felt like he was losing his daughter because she was learning English and she was learning how to read and write better than he could, and he felt like it was going to separate her identity. And um, I remember last year at the table, I remember talking about identity, and that was my word for this year, if you're familiar with John Gordon, but that was kind of my focus because it's about your values and beliefs, um, and that influences how we live out each day. What we, what we value and believe is how we think and act. And in this experience with Caesar, um, what he did say to me um, as he wrote the first one, he said, you know, Mrs. Hordisky, how I said I don't like poetry and that I probably would never write a poem. Well, I just did. <laughs> and I'm about to write another one, which is why you have the two <laughs> poems there, because he felt compelled to write from the father's perspective as well. And, and through this, the idea of empathy and the connections he was able to make to this on his own, because he, he talked about how... Um, I could tell he was feeling a little uncomfortable as he worked through some of these emotions, and I said, it can feel uncomfortable, can it? And he said, yeah. He said, well, we'll just sit with it a minute, and this is what came out of that. Um, but that idea where just pausing and allowing them to feel the emotions and to work through this through literacy is one of those ways that we can incorporate social-emotional learning into the work that we do. It's this ongoing, integrated approach to um, <coughs> empowering learners because that's what he took away from this is he walked away saying I'm always up for a challenge mm -hmm. and he said and I'm really proud of myself and with that he's motivated then to continue the work of learning around poetry even though he didn't think he could and this is what um, I wanted to make sure I took with me is moments like this that idea that when I stay focused on the learner and the fact that I am helping shape, create um, young people who can do great things if they realize what they have inside them, that that's what's going to change <coughs> education, ultimately. And that I don't want to lose sight of that ever because there are always going to be changes that's inevitable, whether it's some um, teachers know the pendulum that swings, we talk about that often, or the winds that, that change, or the next great new program that comes out and different people all well-intentioned have different ideas and it can sometimes um, make it feel like we are being pushed in different directions and that's where we just need to make sure we're staying focused on students like Caesar and these the human beings that they are deep inside and influencing their identities as well so thank you so much for um, everything that I have had the opportunity to learn from each of you. Um, it has been such an honor and such a, a humbling experience. And the more you learn, of course, the more you realize you have to learn. And so that's why, again, I view this kind of as the, the, my commencement of moving on into what I'm going to do now because it's uh, been such a learning experience. So I thank you and my family has been wonderfully supportive and all of the wonderful educators like those behind me who have I several I've had the opportunity to learn with and from um, because that's what pushes me to continue growing and to, to figure out more ways to help students like Caesar. So thank you.
Dr. Z and Cassandra, I think you have a presentation. <laughs> The June meeting is always uh, bittersweet for us because we get to welcome a new teacher of the year, but yay, but we also have to say goodbye to the current teacher of the year. And I've been on the board for 10 years and I have to tell you every single teacher of the year that comes is unique and brings a different perspective to the board table and we learn so much um, by having the teacher of the year with us. And we're really fortunate in the state of Michigan because not every state does this and um, it's to their own detriment because they don't get the opportunity that we get to hear every single board meeting from someone who is literally living the job. Um, we're going to really miss you because you have um, brought kind of this perspective to the board of really being engaged. And uh, I think every single day you were out trying to meet with, um, with other teachers and with students and doing hands-on activities and bringing that perspective back to the board uh, was really important for us to hear and to see. Um, but you also wanted to, like you said, not only educate others, but also use this as a learning opportunity. And I know that you're, you're in your final stages of national board certification, which congratulations, that's really exciting. Um, but we're, we're really gonna miss having your perspective at the, the table and we're gonna uh, love having a new teacher of the year, but um, we're gonna miss what you brought. The table. So. Just want to thank you for your effectiveness in uh, your personality as, as well as your deliberate actions uh, in projecting a real optimism about the future. You know, education uh, cannot happen if there's no hope for the future. Uh, but you project that, and, and I can see how effective you are with students, making them excited about discovering the unknown, that that's going to be a, an enjoyable thrill, that, that that's, that's worth persisting at. And you shared that with, with us on the state board. Sometimes we need some encouragement, too. And uh, so it's been a real joy to have you with us. Thank you so much, Tracy. So we'd like to present you with this resolution in honor of your um, service to the state of Michigan. Thank you. Let's retake that picture. You have something on your projector was catching oh, you. So if you, if you move closer to Cassandra. You should be more in the middle. Okay. Oh, yeah. yeah. You get blue. Your face is blue. I can't see you. Yeah. yeah, you got to turn those. <laughs> you got a dog. That's basically what you're doing. It's coming right in my face. Why don't we go over here? Yeah. Nope, you're good. Oh, So on May 23rd at East Kentwood High School in Greater Grand Rapids, I made a surprise announcement naming Luke Wilcox as the 2017-18 Michigan Teacher of the Year, although I think he had a hint it was coming with everything that was happening at the school. But Lupe uh, Ramos uh, was joined me as well as Tracy uh, at the celebration. Luke is a math teacher and is described by his colleagues as living and breathing education. He has 15 years of classroom experience and was selected from dozen of uh, outstanding nominees statewide. So I'd like to invite Abby up to the table and she's going to make some opening remarks about the announcement and then introduce Luke to us. First, Tracy, I'd like to add my voice and say thank you for a great year. Thank you. Uh, your passion for connecting with educators across Michigan and nationally is truly inspiring, and it's been great to watch over the course of this past year. Thank you, Abby. Uh, so through reaching other educators and students, your impact on teaching has also been multiplied and will continue, I'm sure, uh, in your future endeavors. So thank you. This year, we had dozens of nominations from around the state for the Michigan Teacher of the Year competition. 
and we narrowed it down to five finalists. The interview panel consisted of a state board member, Lupe Ramos Montini, an education organizer, organization member, a former teacher of the year, Pam Harlan from the Mimic Education Foundation, and a staff member here from the MDE. We now have a short video to show that will portray the excitement that followed the announcement of the Teacher of the Year at East Kentwood High School. <coughs> A surprise assembly at East Kentwood High School teacher was named a, the Michigan Teacher of the Year today. Luke Wilcox is a math teacher and is described by his colleagues as someone who lives and breathes education. State Superintendent Brian Whiston visited the school in order to graduate him. I was emotional, like walking up on the stage, like teary-eyed and high fives from the students was, was awesome. Uh, but I, I mean, I, I see this as a, a huge opportunity for me to uh, share the story of what we do here at East Kentwood High School uh, and, and also to try and positively influence education in the state of Michigan. East Kentwood High School has also given $1,000 from the Steensma Agency on behalf of Mimic Insurance Company as part of Wilcox's recognitions. The Michigan Teacher of the Year is selected by a committee that reviews nominees from teachers throughout the year. A grand introduce you to Luke Wilcox, high school mathematics teacher at East Kentwood High School in the Kentwood Public School District and our 2017-2018 Michigan Teacher of the Year. Yeah, thank you so much. I would like to point out that Abby is an East Kentwood High School graduate. Oh. Uh, I had nothing to do with the process. There was, there was, no, there was no overlap. We, we just we, we checked the dates on that. But um, I'm, I'm absolutely uh, thrilled to, to be in this position this year. I can't tell you how uh, humbling an experience it is to be even just represented with these f f uh, four educators here, but, but thousands of educators across the state of Michigan. And just to be considered for this uh, is, is, is really an honor for me. And uh, I, I'm so proud of what we do in, in schools here in Michigan. I'm so excited about like the opportunity to try and uh, uh, have an influence on that over the next year. And so I, I definitely look forward to, to uh, this, this crazy experience that Tracy is already trying to warn me about. But I'm, I'm really, uh, really, really excited about it. Thank you, Luke. Just wanted to note as well that accompanying Luke today is his principal at East Kentwood High School, Mr. Omar Bakri and Superintendent Michael Zorhoff and Luke's family and friends. She'll call you. Abby so will call you. Thank you, Luke. We are looking forward to working with you in the upcoming year. And I'd now like to move into uh, introducing you to the four uh, finalists for the Before Michigan. you do that, I just want to say it was an exciting day at the high school. You can generally yeah. see mm -hmm. the excitement in your colleagues' eyes, the, uh, the students, staff. A lot to celebrate after some kind of some rough years there at the school for a lot of people. And mm -hmm. so a great celebration and it's a great honor. Thank, and thank congratulations. you. Congratulations. All right, for our finalists, would you please come to the table when I introduce you? And Superintendent Whiston and board members will present you with a framed certificate and a pin. I will then introduce the principal or superintendent from your school or district, and Superintendent Whiston will also present them with a plaque for your school. In alphabetical order, first is Jennifer Crotty. Ms. Crotty is an 11th and 12th grade AP government and economics teacher at Fitzgerald High School with Fitzgerald Public <coughs> We interrupted you, you gotta say that. <laughs> <laughs> we were talking, go ahead, start over. That's right, which, oh, all right. this is Jennifer Crotty. <laughs> Ms. Crotty is an 11th and 12th grade AP government and economics teacher at the Fitz, at Fitzgerald High School with the Fitzgerald Public School District. Great. Certainly, congratulations to you. Yeah. yeah, thank you for all your great service and the great teaching and uh, that you represent the best of in the state. Thanks for all you do. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you. 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 Yep. All right, we'll now invite uh, Ms. Kimberly Serrini. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
is Mr. Raymond Herrick. Mr. Herrick teaches 9th through 12th grade mathematics at Williamston High School with the Williamston Community Schools. We now invite Dr. Uh, Jeff Tanis to the table as well. is Dave Stewart Jr. Mr. Stewart teaches world history and English at Cedar Springs High School with the Cedar Springs Public School District. is Gina Wilson. Ms. Wilson teaches mathematics and science at Early College Alliance at Eastern Michigan University with the Washtenaw Educational Options Consortium. Ms. Ellen Fisher to the table.
I'll note that uh, Gina is also going to be featured in one of our upcoming Proud Michigan Educator videos over the summer. So you'll get to learn a little bit more about uh, her position and what she does. I'd also like to take a moment and recognize Pam Harlan, who is here with us today from the Mimic Foundation, which is part of Mimic Insurance Company. She is not here today, uh, but I'll tell you a little bit more about what she does. <laughs> the Mimic Foundation provides tremendous support for the Michigan Teacher of the Year program. We are happy to say that the Mimic Foundation finances all related to travel costs during the year of service in an amount of $10,000 per year for our employee. A $1,000 check to East Kentwood High School, uh, and in the fall we'll present checks to the schools of our four finalists. Thank you so much to Pam and the Mimic Foundation. Their support is instrumental to the, to the success of the Michigan Teacher of the Year program. We now have a resolution and certificate to present to Luke. Ms. Albrich and Dr. Ziley, please come to the foot of the table and present the statue and resolution to Luke along with the certificate, card, and pin. Okay. I signed this one, so I'll give it. <laughs> I feel ownership. Michigan schools, how we can do things better, uh, the effects of our policy on the ground level, uh, and um, and your advice and input will be so important to our making an informed and hopefully beneficial decisions. So we welcome you to the board this year. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I'd like to invite uh, Principal Baxter and Superintendent Zorhoff to the table. I'm going to give you this plaque so that you can hang in the school, recognizing the teacher of the year. Good to see you. Give congratulations. Thank you for your good work and mentoring and helping him become something. Congratulations to the superintendent as well. For mutually beneficial. Yes. Squeeze in. Squeeze in. Should we take a five minute break? Yeah, we will. Okay. Do you have any additional comments? Well, I just, uh, the other teachers of the year were recognized. Did you have any comments you wanted to make or anybody you wanted to thank? The other finalists? I just to give you an opportunity. Right there, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, Crystal. Yep. Thank all right. you all that. Congratulations. <laughs> Well, the best thing about this is we're going to take a five-minute recess so you guys don't have to stay through the whole meeting. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll also note, just oh, finally, uh, please join us for a reception down on the upper level in Ottawa 3 uh, to honor our new Teacher of the Year, our outgoing Teacher of the Year, and all of our finalists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, don't you be the way, the yeah, I'm going now. Oh, no, okay. I'm, no, I'm going to party. Kim Trent?
Board meeting back to order. First item on the Committee of the Whole agenda is presentation on revised K-12 physical education standards. The state of Michigan last updated the K-12 physical ed standards in 2008. The new revision will consolidate many documents into an updated, easier to follow format and will assist schools in teaching students skills to encourage lifelong fitness. Next steps is following a brief period of public comments. The board will be asked to approve the standards in August. Today to present, we have Kyle Grant, Deputy Superintendent for Finance and Operations, and Kim Kowalczyk, Supervisor Coordinator, School Health and Safety Programs. Take it away. Good morning. Uh, thank you, and we're excited to present the uh, draft standards for your uh, input and consideration before hopefully we can send it out for public comment. So we're just going to talk through a little bit about um, kind of what the state of, of physical education is here in Michigan, uh, why we revised the standards, what was the kind of impetus and the process that we followed in, in getting to this point today. Uh, the current uh, standards were approved by the board in 2007, um, so obviously that's a 10-year period where there's been, you know, changes and advancements over that time period on uh, effective and best practice uh, strategies for teaching uh, and learning physical education. Um, the Shape America, which is the Society of Health and Physical Educators, uh, which is the national uh, group for, for this work, uh, revised the national standards in 2013. So again, um, a lot of, a lot of uh, shift in focus, a lot of uh, changes have happened at a time that we would like to incorporate in our standards here in Michigan. As part of uh, our plan, Michigan's plan for to be a top 10 uh, state for education in 10 years, uh, the plan specifically calls out the need for a wraparound or, or educating the whole child. Um, and physical education is obviously a large por portion of that. It's really contained in goal four of our top 10 and 10 plan our ESSA plan and, and uh, pieces of the legislation around ESSA specifically name physical education as an integral part for a well-rounded education. And really the, the, the biggest change you'll see in the, in the revised standards is really moving our physical education standards to reflect an emphasis on cooperative learning and physical fitness uh, that allows for a focus on personalized learning and gets away from um, a more kind of sports-centric um, physical education class. So uh, we really want to try and uh, teach students skills to be uh, physically active throughout the lifespan. So this word, the wording on this question is a little, a little funky. Um, I know there's a scientific reason why uh, it's funky, but really it's, it's, a, it's essentially saying how many students didn't have uh, access or didn't take physical education in Michigan high schools. Uh, this is from the Michigan Youth Risk Behavior Survey, which is uh, part of the uh, part of the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control um, Surveillance uh, System. So essentially, the, it's saying that 60, a little over 68 percent of our high school students didn't take or didn't have physical education um, in 2015 in their high school um, experience. Uh, we further done have done some. Uh, uh, state-specific surveying. Um, back in 2014, we, we did a PE and phys physical activity survey in which 555 school districts responded. Some just highlights from there is less than 10% of schools provided daily physical education in elementary school. Um, when you look at the national standards for a uh, number of minutes that students should receive, both at the at the elementary level, at the K-5 level, it's recommended to have 150 minutes per week. And at the secondary level, which is grades 6 through 12, it's recommended to have 225 minutes per week. <clears throat> Only 17% of our high schools met that benchmark uh, in the state in 2014. And the majority of our, of our K-6 or elementary buildings, 61% uh, provided 90 minutes or less of physical education per week. So. Um, we're not we're not unlike uh, uh, other states in the sense of physical education and the amount of time spent um, for students to be uh, to be in physical education in our state um, has has diminished over the last ten years um, and that's really at all time lows, especially at our elementary building levels. Uh, this this set of data is from our, our 2016 school health profiles, which is also a, a CDC sponsored surveillance tool. What, what this graphic is really saying is for our students um, that, um, you know, with the half credit uh, of uh, physical education that's required as part of the merit curriculum, where are students taking that class at? And as you can see, the majority of them are taking that class um, as freshmen in high school, 92 
uh, percent of high schools are offering that required class there. There is a, um, some growth in the middle school level as, as we've seen uh, the ability to teach that content um, before you get to high school. Um, to you know, kind of a personal learning track to, to do some of the credit taking before they reach high school. And you can see the significant drop off after um, their freshman year where you get into 10th, 11th, and 12th and it's um, drops off significantly. <coughs> With that, I'm gonna turn over to Kim to talk a little bit about the process that we went through to uh, develop the standards that are before you today and, and some highlight some of the uh, key changes. Thank you. <coughs> So a little over, no, a little under a year ago, we started the process pulling a stakeholder group um, to meet, to review where we were at, where we wanted to go, and uh, review the standards that have been uh, put out nationally by Shape America, the professional membership group for health and PE teachers. Um, as they progressed um, the, through September through January, they had a draft document that was developed and, and, and revisions by uh, the professionals in, these, in the field and um, for them to get these initial drafts for review and revision. So I just want you to see a, a sampling of the partners from institutes of higher education, um, educators in the field, and from professional groups. These represent elementary, across the grade span, elementary, middle, and high school experts in these areas. Some of the changes that um, you'll see throughout the document that's been provided in front of you in your packet. Um, one, of the biggest, one of the bigger changes is for the ninth through 12th grade, uh, these standards have been split into two levels. Uh, the level uh, one standards are minimal knowledge and skills. It's your basic that helps students get the necessary skills uh, and support they need um, for career and college readiness. Level two builds on that. It allows for, if you wanna take PE for a full year rather than a one semester, you don't have to retake uh, the level one or the basic uh, PE that's offered. You can take a more advanced and something more interesting and that can be um, flexible or um, individual for the, for the students. Another change Kyle started to also mention is it's not, they're not sports focused and only team sports are on a particular sport. It allows for the professional uh, judgment and the professional um, expertise of teachers to help students meet the skills and knowledge goals to get what they need um, to be, to be well-rounded students for now and for in the future. It allows for that personalized learning that um, students need to be career and college ready. Um, one specific call out is around water safety. This is a, a national discussion as well. Um, due to a wide range of availability of pools in may or may not be in schools, um, this recommendation was removed and left the local level to decide if it's kept in um, what is taught in PE and to the um, uh, professional development of the instruct the teacher as well. So it's a, it's um, aligned later uh, with along with the teacher prep standards in PE as well. And one other change that you'll see, one last notable change is at the beginning of the document on page eight, there is an emphasis that talks about the link with the importance of PE and supporting uh, students to be career and college ready for the future. future. Um, it goes beyond just motor skills and knowing how to do the competencies um, at the various levels, but also goal setting, interpersonal skills, um, stress management, building confidence, things that helps kids succeed in the classroom and into the future. Um, and it aligns with other content areas that um, may also focus on those skills. So for us, we've brought the, the, the draft document to you today to review and consider. Um, we would take it out for public comment, for the 30-day public comment. 
Um, we would send that out through a variety of means and methods, through our networks, through professional groups, parental groups, um, fitness foundation, and um, through districts and other educators, and collect that comment, pull it together, bring back a finalized document with any major noted uh, comments or changes for, for you at the August board meeting to review. One thing I forgot to mention earlier, I can mention briefly too, uh, the um, item that will be before you later today on the preparation standards for teachers of uh, physical education. Uh, the the internally, um, you know, Kim and her folks and folks from teacher prep um, have worked jointly and as we've redeveloped both the professional preparation standards for physical education and the standards for students. So there is uh, uh, a lot of, there's total really alignment of um, what we were, were proposing to require of students in, in higher ed as they go through their preparation program on how to teach these new content standards. So just wanted to call out the fact that, you know, internally we've been aligned and have been working together to make sure that those two efforts are, are coordinated. Questions of the board? Go to Brian. Dr. Z and then Tom, please. On uh, uh, the one section in career and college race, skills taught in PE go beyond motor skills and physical fitness. Could you unpack that for me a little more? Sure. So, you know, thinking about um, uh, conflict resolution skills, you know, if, if, if there's pieces that, you know, when you're playing a game, you're learning uh, um, a motor skill specifically, um, you know, and, and I guess I'd just take an example of playing a, a team sport or having team a team sport. You've learned the motor skill to throw a ball, to throw a baseball, or to play catcher. You know, you've, you've learned the skills to be physically active. But then as you learn the skills to participate in, in, in a given sport or a given game, you know, conflicts arise. So how do you, how do students help navigate that conflict? As Kim mentioned, as you look at some of the, the skill sets and strategies that are in to teach conflict resolution as part of physical education, those are overlap or are, are similar to what we see in our health education curriculum to teach conflict resolution skills that could be applied in an interpersonal setting between, you know, Lupe and I might get in a fight about something. So how you resolve that conflict, how you learn those skills to negotiate that um, are similar, whether it's interpersonally or in the context of uh, playing baseball or playing basketball. So the, yeah, uh, so the one slide saying that uh, students who didn't attend, did not attend physical education classes for one or more days, like set, you know, 60, 70 percent. Mm -hmm. So that's because, I mean, so does that mean that they, they had no opportunity? I mean, a lot of, we also heard that a lot of kids don't have opportunity for recess anymore. They're eliminating that. Right. I mean, do these kids get any chance to kind of exert their physic I mean, you know, this is just sitting in a class for the whole day. Yeah. yeah. Is that how, is that, I mean, is there any, is that what's happening now? I mean, we're, in that instance, I mean, we're particularly focused on what that looks like in the elementary space, given, you know, younger kids need to move more. Um, and there's a growing body of research that shows the the brain benefits of the physio neurological benefits of being physically active and how that translates right. into, into the classroom. Um, I guess to answer your question, I mean, it, it widely varies, but the data that we have, and you look at national data, it is trending downward. I mean, some schools that may be reducing their physical education offerings are trying to implement things in the classroom like brain breaks or other ways to get kids moving uh, during the day to, to give them that opportunity. Right. But as a whole in our state, it's not, it's not where we think it needs to be. Yeah, I mean, I think part of my reason for uh, reducing high-stakes testing is I think high stakes testing has brought about, if it's not on the test, and certainly physical education is not, or, or recess is not on the test, mm -hmm. and so they just eliminate it in order to make sure that their kids are getting a higher grade on that one, one exam. And I, I just think this is one of the, of the downfalls of high stakes testing is that uh, you get kids sitting all day uh, in order to try to do better on that one exam. It's just, I, I'm glad that we're moving away from that, this board is. Yeah, and I agree with that, Tom. I mean, there's kids need to be moving, but even a lot of, uh, you go into a lot of elementary classes, and while the teachers are doing brain breaks and are doing exercises during classes every 10 to 15 minutes, because we know that stimulates the brain, but we agree with you wholeheartedly that there's been a reduction in art, music, gym, 
mm -hmm. uh, over the last and decade recess. and recess, and it's not a good thing. Right. I have Eileen and then Nikki, please. Um, well, I would third the lack of exercise. I, I uh, at one point was assistant Cub Scout leader for my son's troop, and the only way that we could get these kids to focus was to run them around the building three times mm -hmm. after school ended before they sat down or else it was hopeless. Right. Uh, but uh, I'm concerned about water sports a lot. Um, uh, unlike every other sport that's in here, uh, water's the only environment that kids aren't going to be trained in anymore, and you can drown easily, and mm -hmm. you can be crowded with lakes. Uh, I understand yeah. the national push on this is a democratization effort because schools can't afford facilities, but I'm, and I think, I suspect that any, any uh, schools that have pools and have teams for swimming and for water polo will continue, but this is a real concern of mine. Mm -hmm. I think it's a dangerous move. And uh, I don't know that we can address it, um, but I'm, I'm hopeful that uh, that thought will go into pushing schools to find a way in August, to find a nearby lake even, just to acquaint kids so they can float. Um, I think it's a, uh, an oversight that we'll regret. And it's I, not an oversight. I think it's a strategy that we'll regret. I think I know the answer to this, so I'm going to look to <laughs> Mary T. Jotsman, the one who's been really coordinating this for us, and to Kim. But sure. Uh, it's, the reason that we didn't include them in the standards is because it, it, it incorporates, you know, grades and, and, and schools sure. having to do that. That we have resources, there are resources for schools that choose to teach uh, water sports as part of that. They have the facilities or they have the means to, um, to do that, how to do that effectively. So um, while they're not necessarily included in the standards, there are, there are um, standards like documents out there to help schools that want to take this on. So. Um, and I, I guess I get the other part of your question of, of like pushing or encouraging folks to make sure they do that. And you know, when you look at um, our schools along the shoreline or, or counties along, the, you you see them all our lakes, yeah, <laughs> all our inland lakes. Mm -hmm. And I just worry about it because of course they can't teach it during the year when when lakes are frigid. But if you've got a nearby body of water, I see no point in mm -hmm. pulling back from this in a way that might say to people, you don't have to do this anymore either. Mm -hmm. um, when in reality, I think that every child in Michigan, with the number of lakes we've got and and the commitment to swimming in the schools, should have access to that. Mm -hmm. Don't know how to do it though. We have Nikki and then uh, Dr. Zina Michelle. I was going to echo Eileen's sentiment. Um, right as I was looking at the standards a little bit further last night, there was an article about four people dying over the weekend um, on lakes in Michigan. So, anyhow. But the other question I had um, on page five, it talks about uh, revising the standards um, to allow for personalized learning. Can you help me to understand that a little bit more? What would that what is your your guys' foresight in terms of how those standards would play out in that type of environment? I'm going to ask Mary to take the tackle on that one. Hi. Um, yeah, a lot of what we're looking at is when we look at the K-12 span of the standards, the elementary is really focused on kind of that skills base, teaching the kids, you know, about hand-eye coordination and the tracking and the skipping and all of those things that are skills based. Once we get up into the secondary education, that's going to be more um, personalized focus, looking at their own special interests and, and how to motivate them to stay more physically active throughout their life. So we could be looking at teaching them how to use heart rate monitors, how to use Fitbits, and try, just trying to really explore how they can find something that interests them, that keeps them going. So would it, yeah, would it be within a, a specific class um, time or would they have the opportunity to do yeah, I, I, think I, I think that's going to be where the locals, um, that local control piece is going to come in. They're going to work in the class to teach them how to get those basic fundamentals, but then hopefully the schools and the communities will be working to show them what's available to them outside to be able to continue. So there is opportunity for them to essentially pursue their yeah. passions and own endeavors. And that, that is the goal. Yeah. And or, so if you think about um, high school, secondary, your schedule, you'll have um, the first semester, the PE class that everyone may take, participate in, to get your all the basic skills. If you want to take a full year of PE, you might have a, a, a the second semester. You could select from choices of classes that are more of interest to you. So, um, one student might be interested in more of the class that's focused on dance. Another student might be more in the weight and conditioning for the second semester, and that can help really build on things that they want to enhance more so that gives them this second level so they are getting more than the basic and something that can be individualized from them. 
Dr. Z and Michelle, please. Michelle, Michelle please. Thank you. Um, well, I had a couple of questions. One, um, with an eye of um, what can the board do to help support um, providing more physical movement and activity mm -hmm. in the classrooms, and what can we, you know, what, what does the department um, have any recommendations about how to get how, how we can do that. I know we're talking about the dashboard and we brought, we're putting extra things and we keep adding more things. But, um, in, and, uh, I, and I, I know um, the requirements for graduation, you say it's only um, one half credit, if that's a requirement that you have for high school? I know we've had some changes in that, but I think it's combined with health now. Yeah, it is. It's one credit of health and PE, and that's a half a credit for each for contest each. area. Uh, and the requirements for the, the um, like the K-12 <coughs> or K-6 or yeah, K-8? it's really vague in the state. <coughs> it's for health and PE, when you look at K-8, it just says that it has to be established and um, offered in all public schools in the state. So that's that's pretty much the extent of the legislation. The State Board of Ed passed the policy in 2012 um, on physical education and physical activity. That's much more comprehensive. That addresses recess, that addresses recess before lunch. Um, as well as the national recommendations for the <coughs> recommended minutes. So there's and a pretty um, the comprehensive policy that the court passed a few years ago. But okay. legislation wise is pretty big. So maybe we should look, look at those. So I, I did have a couple of specific questions. So the swim um, in uh, water sports, uh, our teacher prep, is that dropped from the teacher prep now? Um, it, but yeah it was it's kind of this it's this push to schools really were giving some pushback when we had the standards as well because they're like I don't have the resources to do this so we wanted to keep them in the standards there is an acknowledgement about how critical they are and especially um, if you look in the introduction there's a piece that says what's not covered in the standards <coughs> and we talk about the water course and acknowledge that Michigan is a water state so we really strongly encourage schools to continue to look at ways to provide that um, but kind of taking it out of the standards to take away the pressure of those schools that so but we won't have teachers that are that could even I mean they're not being required to have that as part of their certification I, I, they weren't PE. before um, so it was for PE um, for PES if, if they were going to teach sports we have a guidelines document for swimming um, that says that the teachers in order to be able to instruct in that had to have a lifeguard certification and if they didn't have a lifeguard certification they had to have a lifeguard there and we always recommend that they have a lifeguard anyway there because it's hard to teach 30 kids in a swimming class right and, yeah, you know, yeah. keep eyes on the safety piece as well so those were guidelines that were already in place before the revision of the standards okay and just to echo some of the things that Tom has said because I remember when I was taking some tours especially with the EAA with this new year-round schooling and we're talking about this you know this year-round um, and then you know people uh, encouraging more class time extended days mm -hmm. extended year I'm really concerned that there it's it's um, it's restricting their opportunities to engage and just play and um, having fun mm -hmm. so I, I um, and I like the idea of people taking um, you know becoming physically aware but um, it just to have that unstructured play mm -hmm. and um, in opportunities for movement I was just talking to one of the physician educators at Wayne State yesterday Dr. Rossi Noreen Rossi mm -hmm. and she's saying so many of our ailments can just be cured by regular physical activity mm -hmm. um, and, and uh, so I, I'm just and going back to what I started with if there you know I'm wondering what we can do to help encourage encourage that or insist on that and I'm I, uh, it's, um, so I'm open to any suggestions you might have mm -hmm. um, to how, to, how to do that I think it's very important I think some of those recommendations are already contained in the policy in the board policy for okay. PEPA so I mean there's okay. I mean that comes down to I mean re resources right mm -hmm. time as a resource in terms of the amount of minutes that students have the ability to be taught to be physically active um, time to um, um, exert those be exhibit those behaviors, whether it's in recess or 
um, or before and after school, you know, and then, you know, the dollars actually support schools well, and doing that. I mean, those are the partner. biggest three. Yeah, I'm thinking of ways to partner with uh, resources in the community, mm -hmm. um, you know, Boys and Girls Clubs or whatever. Some of those are pulled out of our city, mm -hmm. unfortunately, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. of Detroit. Um, but if there are ways to, like, uh, mm -hmm. to encourage that communication and opportunities for kids for, um, to be engaged in, in things in the community, so. We can put down some thoughts on paper okay. for you that we have and, and share with you. And, and then there's one last one, because my daughter is a PE major. Mm. <laughs> she's having a heck of a time passing the teacher prep. And she's an awesome athlete. Um, she's much, and I talked to teachers in the PE program at Wayne State, and they say, you know, their students are, are gifted in some things, not necessarily taking tests um, or scoring, uh, you know, a certain score in a certain test, which she's got to pass <coughs> in order to even take the advanced classes in her program. Um, so uh, I'm not saying that it should be dumbed down, but is there some way to recognize the abilities of someone who might be a great PE teacher, even if they don't mm -hmm. score a certain score on math? Mm -hmm. You know, um, and I, uh, so it's a little bit, you know, self-interest on my part, but, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so that, that's all my comments. All right. Uh, Tom? I just have one on process, just so I know, uh, because going out for standards, it, I'm new on the board, so I want to make sure I understand, and the, with the teacher prep, I started understanding a little bit about it, but mm -hmm. what will happen is, and is it statutory or policy of the board, and then you go out and anybody can uh, make comments? How widely, how aggressively do we look for comments? Like, is it a little hidden, you know, if you want to give comments, or is it a, you know, do we try to get it out there somehow? And are people given the opportunity to put their name? I think the ones we got for the teacher prep, I think they were all anonymous. Do they have to be anonymous? Can they give their name if they want to? And then finally, do they get a receipt so that, you know, if I tell them, look, I, I got the comments, I, which you get, which was forwarded to me for the teacher prep, mm -hmm. and yours wasn't on, you know, I didn't hear anything. You know, is there a way to, that they can know that they, mm -hmm. that the board or that, you know, the MD got mm -hmm. them? A lot, of a lot of questions there, but, <laughs> but it's a process. I really need yeah. to know what, how yeah, this good works. Question. That's a good, that's a good question. Oh. Typically, our, our process is, you know, we'll, we'll do an, some version of electronic feedback as, as part of it, right? So we'll have an electronic survey either through SurveyMonkey or we, we use other services that allow um, general public, anyone uh, that we will promote through our communication methods through uh, Marty's office um, and work with our networks to say, if you're interested or you know people are interested, you can go to this place and provide comments. Um, we also will uh, reach out to specific um, groups in this area that are working in this area, whether it's the Government Students Foundation or other groups that are, you know, working and have them send it out to their membership to try and promote it. Um, we work with um, uh, a group, Parent Action for Healthy Kids, that works on engaging parents around, you know, kind of health and school climate and culture pieces. We will have them work their networks to reach out specifically to parents and you know, kind of pick, pick professional groups that we would, again, reach out with and try and get them to promote it through their networks. Um, and then we usually have it out between, uh, you know, 30 days is usually our standard timeline to leave it open for public comment. Um, if you do the um, electronic version, you do get a receipt that, you know, thank you for your submission so people know that, you know, it's been, it's been submitted. Okay. Um, and there's, um, in addition, on the, on the public release, if people don't have access to computers but they do hear about the comment period and they have access, um, there'll be an address they could submit written paper comment or facts so we want to make sure they have multiple methods to I mean it. as a legislator I felt this was the most important because we we don't know exactly how it's going to affect the local at, at the mm -hmm. on the ground level mm -hmm. and the people that will actually be impacted by it are the people that I value most hearing from and I want to hear everything mm -hmm. and so I've always pushed to be very how, how can we be more aggressive is it a policy how, how do you just determine is it a is it a formal procedure? Did the board set that, or for when we go out thirty for public day public comment? comment that? Do we is that something that That's I can? Is there a policy that I can see? 
That's, I mean, it's been the board's practice. I don't know if there's an actual resolution or policy related to public comment or the structure of public comment across okay. the spectrum, mm -hmm. but if that's, there is, that's I'd been like our, to see our it. practice. There, I don't think there's anything written. It's just a process we've used per the board. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And, and because right. Tom and Nikki are coming into this, because of the special ed rules uh, promulgation a couple of years ago, and the, um, the problems that we had reaching the right people uh, well in, it, with all of the variables, faxes, letters, uh, social media, um, the, the department has been extremely proactive and has added uh, everything that has ever come up as a possibility. Okay. Okay. Uh, it doesn't mean it couldn't be listed and given to us, but it's, they've been extraordinarily good about trying to find new ways of reaching people. Okay. Thank you. Dr. Dizzee, going back to you, did you have anything? Um, well, just questions of safety, like, you know, don't touch down electric wires and the undertow that uh, is the dread of western Michigan, I mean, Lake Michigan there. Uh, are these in the health curriculum, uh, I'm assuming, or, or, or the PE curriculum? Or? Um, the, things like the, the safety issues that you're, like the down wires, those kinds of things, there aren't necessarily standards that specific. Okay. Um, so there are safety things in the health as standards, and actually you guys will probably be <coughs> seeing them in the fall because we're revising them as we speak. Um, but as far as um, like undertones and that kind of thing, you aren't going to get things that specific in the standards themselves. Um, the standards are a kind of a minimal base um, knowledge for teachers to say, okay, I can. I, this is what I need to build my curriculum off of. So more detailed nuances like that is what you're going to find in the curriculum, not necessarily the standards. Might you have open-ended kinds of uh, things in the standard, like what are the five most hazardous things in your community? You know, these need to be, children need to be taught this uh, and made aware at, at certain grade level or something like that. That's a, I think that's something we can take into consideration yeah. as they're yeah, working with the health ed. Okay. But again, standards tend to keep it kind of open-ended to allow for that local, um, that local piece for them to be able to say, this is what our community needs, this is how we need to work it, and, and take them from there. I, I know that there are several of us on the board who are interested in uh, how uh, local issues uh, can be expressed or acknowledged or encouraged uh, in terms of, of standards for instruction. So where those where those things may exist and we're not aware of them, that would be helpful for you to point those out to us. Okay. Yeah. A lot of times we encourage them to look at the data. Okay. Things like if they, if they use the Michigan profile for health and use, which is their local data, um, we really encourage them to take a look into that and, and to dive into that to see where they really need to provide their instruction. Um, you know, because the data in Detroit is going to look much different than the data that you get in the so um, really allowing for that flexibility for them to do that. Thank you. Um, so I'd like to, because we're charged with supervising education throughout Michigan, I'd like to bring up the, the juxtaposition, the clash of local values against safety. Um, because if we cannot require something that we know is really important, um, uh, then uh, people from the east side of the state who go over to the west side of the state are going to get caught in the undertow on Lake Michigan, and it's the locals who are going to have to risk their life to save them. Um, so I, I just I'm looking at this, thinking, how can we pass this opportunity to not at least have a conversation about whether the state police or EMTs could could be partnering with people statewide? I mean, is there a way to get that information to kids while they're growing, without dictating to local districts that they, that you you have to? We are telling you you have to do this, and we're not funding it specifically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But but I worry about this because this is a state with some particularly interesting geographic uh, uh, features, and it's not fair to say only if you live in that area is that important. It just doesn't work that way when somebody's drowning mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or picking up a live power line, line in water. All right, thank you. The next item on the committee of the whole agenda is presentation on revised model code of student conduct. The 2014 model code of student conduct has been updated to reflect Recent changes in legislation that are scheduled to go into effect August 2017. <coughs> this presentation will review suggested changes before it goes to the public comment. Next step is following a period of public comment, the board will be asked to approve the model code of student conduct at its August meeting. Uh, staying at the table is Kyle and Kim. Take it away. 
Uh, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, as Superintendent Wilson mentioned uh, there was uh, legislation that was passed, um, <coughs> Public Act 360-366 uh, of 2016, which goes into effect in August. Um, strikes um, uh, outdated zero tolerance policy language that was the aim of the bills that were passed and put in the public uh, on, uh, public act. Um, the current Mo the board's current model code of student conduct was approved in August of 2014 and still includes references to zero tolerance because it was the law at the time that the board revised the model code of conduct. So this, the revisions that are before you sh are strictly focused on eliminating any reference or verbiage to zero tolerance policies that were in the board's model code of conduct. And it also um, um, ha adds additional noteworthy changes that were part of that law, which is essentially pieces around restorative practices and other means to alternative to suspension and expulsion that were fortunately already um, incorporated into the board's policy. So um, if you just, just quickly, the the law itself, these, um, these are some of the considerations that um, were, were placed into the law that was passed that it will go into effect in August that really requires uh, schools to look at using restorative practices and as an alternative to suspension and expulsion. Again, something that was already uh, incorporated in the, in the board's model code of conduct. Um, uh, taking considerations before suspending and expelling a pupil, um, that they need to take into account certain factors before they suspend a student. Those are really the two biggest changes in, in the law. Um, when you look at things like restorative practices or other means to alternatives to suspension and expulsion, as you may remember last year, we presented um, on our Safe and Supportive Schools grant that we had from the feds, which was a five-year grant that focused on working with um, some of our, our neediest high schools in our state. 11 of the 22 funded um, uh, high schools implemented restorative practices, and in those schools uh, using restorative practices, they saved uh, just a little over 3,590 days of, of instruction by implementing uh, restorative practices and keeping kids in school instead of suspension expulsion. So I guess I say that to say that we know that there are research-based effective strategies that work to keep kids in school but address the behavior, um, and that's really what the law changes were aimed at, was encouraging and uh, making schools take into account those pieces before they suspend or expel a student. Um, same, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. I was just going to say the same word following a similar process that we just articulated for the for the physical education standards. We will um, take it out for public comment for 30 days, um, and then our goal is to bring it back um, for consideration at the August meeting. Yep. Eileen, please. Sure. Um, thank you for this change. It's a long time in coming, mm -hmm. and very much appreciate it. It's great that we're doing it. I have two concerns um, on the on the slide. <laughs> the noteworthy changes. Mm -hmm. Restorative practices should be the first consideration to remediable uh, remediate offenses such as uh, only interpersonal conflicts um, uh, doesn't lead to something more dramatic. Uh, we just had a young man commit suicide in in Arbor uh, because he was cyberbullied two weekends ago. A ninth grader. Because he was what? Cyberbullying. Um, and uh, uh, the verbal and physical conflicts, damage to property and theft and class disruption, to me, are all uh, an es a possible escalation points. In, in that high school, they use only students for restorative justice. They don't call in parents. Mm -hmm. And I mentioned mm -hmm. this before, uh, but it doesn't seem to me that you can get to a real change on the last four. Interpersonal conflicts, those things happen. Mm -hmm. But the other four are an escalation um, mm -hmm. of, of the interpersonal conflicts. And I don't know, I understand that they're thinking about adding parents, or I, I mean, I never got a really clear answer on mm -hmm. why the school doesn't bring parents in to help cement those things. That's concern yeah. number one. Yeah. Uh, concern number two is on page seven of the document, um, due process for long-term suspension and expulsion. When you remove the sentence, pro bono or affordable legal assistance is available through service providers listed in the online toolkit, which of course isn't going to exist, you then put um, the, uh, uh, the burden on a student to somehow identify either that he has to request the school to give him resources for pro bono or um, low-cost legal services or never get to that. It's just in the way that the document works currently. Mm -hmm. And I personally can't imagine being a homeless kid. I, I, last night at, at um, high school commencement, I heard a student talk about how wonderful his school is, that when a girl fell down the stairway last week, 
the kid stopped, picked her up, and helped her and got the blood off. It made me wonder how many schools there are where kids would walk on by, or more important, not take the hit for some doing something and letting some other kid take the hit. And I, I worry about the, 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 the an unintended weakness of the document. It seems to me that if there's a way to say to schools, um, a list should be provided, uh, but something more proactive on this, because uh, where, where, where pro bono or a low cost legal services are available in the community, a list should be provided to the students. Is that sure. something that we could do and not be in violation of any funding requirements? Or <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I think so. I mean, can, can you go? Yeah, and a lot of times they already do do that. Um, this document is more for stating that we will not contain the list just for capacity reasons. Um, but usually we partner with like groups such as like the Alliance for Students and Families and things of that nature, so the, the Michigan Alliance for Students and Families. And they usually have updated rosters of that. So it's just not a duplication of effort, but theirs is always updated. So we usually refer to that agency to get that information. Can you put that in here? Yeah. Sure yeah. Okay. It just gives the school a path to say, wait a minute, maybe this kid didn't actually do it. There's three other kids who said he didn't, but nobody's identifying who did. And he shouldn't have to take the hit without somebody, um, an adult, being able to help him. Absolutely. Great. Or her. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks. I don't know whether you want to address the first point. The, this, this, so, that there are. Oh, yeah, there sure. Are yeah, you know. like straight out of the legislation. I mean, that piece is, but I think we're... But the we're restorative practices involving parents, um, so that it, it can look in many different ways. Um, again, best practice would be bringing the students and families together, um, but depending on the severity of the situation, it might uh, determined by the district and the school building and the, and the uh, administration, it, 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 it might be a situation where this one is with an advisor, an ad administrator, and the students resolving together on their own as well. As far as our work is concerned, I mean, when we've funded schools or, or we work with places like the dispute resolution centers, I mean, parents mm -hmm. are engaged. I, I guess I'm saying I don't know why they weren't engaged in this situation, but best practice-wise, what we promote is that they are engaged as part of that process. So um, I think I, we've been involved with a situation somewhat like this, but the, the problem that we encountered in the school district encountered is that the FERPA makes it impossible for, just depending on the situation and the parties involved, to share student information. And unless the parents want to come together and resolve the issue directly, it won't get resolved if one side of the one party will not. So restorative practices, including parents, is really key, but then there are other uh, issues that pop up. Mm -hmm. in terms of sharing student information and parents coming together. So how will we attack that, I guess? And, and I think we need to because if there is an issue, an ongoing issue of physical violence, it needs to be addressed. And it, and it can only be addressed if the parents come together and agree that there are certain boundaries, like we don't punch each other in the face, we just can't do that. And if it keeps happening, how do we make it stop? Um, so, you know, I think that, I think we have to tackle that in terms of FERPA and how, how do we empower administrators to bring those parents together? Because I know a number of people that have gone through situations like this, mm -hmm. they don't ever come together. <coughs> it just doesn't happen. It's so uncommon. And, and in our situation um, with my son at school, I, I kept saying I'd like to sit down. I'd like to all of us sit down and agree mm -hmm. that you know there are certain ways to resolve conflict and there are certain ways we don't. Mm -hmm. But we couldn't ever make that happen. And, it, and I think that we kept hearing things like privacy laws and different mm -hmm. things like that. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how we do this mm -hmm. unless we address that. Mm -hmm. and, and unless we empower administrators to say, this is how we're going to address those barriers. Because mm -hmm. um, it would be wonderful for everyone to be able to sit down and just say, hey, let's, let's work this out. But I, don't, I think that piece is really missing. And that will really keep communities separated until we uh, address that piece. Michelle, please. Um, and thank you for right. this work. Yeah. And I, I, um, I, I was involved in some of this. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, I do believe we, the zero tolerance policy, um, because it doesn't provide due process and fair consideration, um, <coughs> it, it, it's, it was never a good idea. Um, but I, I had some questions about the um, the actions that are 
uh, to be considered or the, the things that are supposed to be considered. Mm -hmm. What happens if a school doesn't do that? Which um, they which don't, action? If they don't take, if they don't uh, do so oh, consideration. I'm sorry, I shouldn't yeah. have said it. Actually, mm -hmm. the, the, that they have to consider the age and yes, and and, mm -hmm. and the restorative practices. So if they if they're completely ignoring this or just mm -hmm. not really doing it, um, I guess what's the oversight and consequences? From our perspective, for, as a department mm -hmm. perspective, there's no authority or stick if if there's no process for us to. Work with schools who don't take those considerations into account. Uh, the law simply just says you need to do this. So um, the that oversight, that kind of course correction, is something that is you know kind of placed on either parents or guardians of, of kids if they don't feel like that's been addressed. Parent could yeah. Use this to go to the school board or something. Yeah. Like that. There's nothing. There's nothing in the legislation that has outside entities, whether it's us or some other local group that has purview over. Well, I don't think you school district did what you were supposed to do in this situation. Here's what we're going to do to address that. Right. Okay. Yeah, there, I mean, if, if we're contacted by parents, which we are every day and every week, um, you know, many concerns. Um, yeah, there's, it's recommended that there is a process of uh, working with the district administration, the board, you know, following your district's complaint or concern process. And then if you don't feel it's satisfactorily resolved, you, you know, moving to other, um, if you, you know, other legal or uh, civil rights organizations that would help address that. But there's a. I, I also, for the, so if somebody is, you know, clearly expelled or suspended for more than 10 days or maybe counseled out that this is not mm -hmm. the right place for you, or they signed an agreement saying that they, that they will agree to some code of conduct. Mm -hmm. Does that apply to them as well? Does this, do these procedures for due process, can they challenge? If they signed some agreement saying that they will mm -hmm. blah, 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 do whatever in order to stay in that school. Mm -hmm. and, and, and how, again, does that due process, process work? Well, if, if they're being expelled, um, in that case, or suspended from a school environment because of those reasons, I mean, this would be, it's the action that these um, considerations are supposed to be taking consideration. So for, if they're being sent expelled for those purposes, then yes, they should take these into account no matter what the offense is for why they've been suspended or expelled from school. What was the due process? As a parent, what would be, what could, I, could I insist on a hearing? What, how does that process work or is that? It's literally local board policy determines it. It does so, look different. Yeah. yeah it, as a local superintendent, they could appeal to the board. In my district, some districts you appeal to the administration, so it's really up to local district policies to determine what the next step is for parents if they're not pleased with the decision. Yeah. And usually, before there's an expulsion, there's a hearing where parents are called in, the student involved is called in, and uh, whether it's before an administrator or the board of education, it's kind of like a mini trial where. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The facts are put on the table, parents and students can respond, and then the, the board and or administration makes a decision. There's, is, there a, is it a recommended uh, process on how that should work? Yes, we get, I mean, it's the policies, whatever policy, whether you use NEOLA or uh, school boards associated, whatever policy book you use to govern your district, it would be in your policies. I'm, I'm particularly concerned about um, charter schools. They still have to have elected, policies. They're not elected. Right. All right. So they're not necessarily as. Still should follow the same process. They should. But if they don't, there's, there's basically no recourse. It's Other than going to civil rights or to court. Or legal, yeah. Okay. Tom and then Dr. Z, please. Um, and I, as a charter school board president, I was involved in some expulsions. And it's, I thought that was. Uh, I mean, the, the lawyers were very, you know, making sure we did everything by the book and stuff. But I, we have heard, you know, we've been at uh, gatherings where we've heard that after count day, all of a sudden kids get expelled for, you know, or, you know, counseled out. And so that is a, an issue. And what you're saying is, is that if, like, follow up to Michelle, if they are counseled out or expelled uh, and it seems like it's just the day after count day or whatever uh, that 
there's no recourse other than civil rights or they the parent takes them to court I mean they, they could contact MDE and you guys could kind of we would help them problem solve given given whatever the factors of their situation are but in the end it usually comes down to have you followed your local complaint process have you gone to the superintendent the board maybe you haven't got if you haven't gotten your resolution there then it really turns into I mean, if there are civil rights related factors involved then we would counsel them to reach out to the office of civil rights or legal Good. action i mean that's usually what it boils down to those two tracks in a standard we can i mean i'm a little bit conflict or needing to understand the line between statute and standards so i need your help with this but so we could not put something in here that says if you expel a child then you must provide this document to the parents that says if you feel that you this was not fair we can't do that in standard it would be a statute well yeah well yeah I mean we, we could we could you could put it in the in the in the model code as as what that's what you would like to happen but ultimately schools wouldn't have to do it unless it was in statute okay um, now how does this in, impact I mean there's a lot of is there a lot of gray here uh, and again just tell me if it's statute and that's just the way it is or if it's standard and we have some say in it uh, like verbal conflict I mean an alternative you know somebody that disagrees politically you know a child that fifth grade or sixth or whatever that can be all of a sudden somebody say I'm being assaulted you know verbally when no they're just disagreeing about something and you know free speech issues or you know I mean I, I how are all those gray areas in, in, you know what uh, impact does this does a student code of conduct have when we're trying to decide whether it, it's a verbal attack or just disagreement you know, those are usually outlined in districts' code of conduct policies. So yes, there it could look different from district to district. More importantly, the who the individual he or she that is the administrator or the teacher that is interpreting those those uh, those district policy that that guidance um, is where you find uh, the most gray area because what one person would consider a thoughtful debate about um, you know an issue, political or otherwise, others might conceive as something different and right. you know kids get sent down a different track depending on um, individuals interpretation of that so there is a lot of gray but it's it's ultimately governed by district adoptive policies to say what a behavior whether it's verbal or physical or you know pick a behavior okay. um, what that means in their district as a, a violation of this uh, okay. handbook and then finally um, the old uh, you know you uh, the, the the two the seven-year-old using a stick as a pretend gun during recess mm -hmm. is that addressed I mean and, and then all of a sudden they're ousted because the poor kid was just playing you know mm -hmm. is that addressed in this area um, I mean the I know the zero tolerance stuff but I mean just right. it right. how how would that okay so a seven seven-year-old gets you know he's using a stick as a as a Play, you know during recess and something happens uh, is that possible under this I, mean, I, I would say no but you know the the, the boards the, the local boards policy is going to be the driver so okay. most policies say it has to be a real weapon or be reasonably considered a real weapon you know a toy gun that looks like a right. real gun a stick I don't think anybody's going to mistake as a weapon now that doesn't mean they couldn't discipline the kid for you know, shooting at other kids because they felt it was inappropriate, but I don't think it would take it into expulsion. I would say that's what the actual legislation helps address and the wording in this policy. It's saying not a no tolerance, zero tolerance stance, but consider um, the pupil's Facts. age and would they be playing <clears throat> with a stick? Would they be, you know, consider a lot more factors of this okay. is black and white, yes or no? Okay, good. So. So we're freeing up the locals to do some more things here. Okay, good. More flexibility. Yeah. So I did want to address one other point that Tom raised, which is a good point that in the past there was an incentive for districts to expel or suspend students after count date. That is really lessened under new account uh, uh, counting rules because now if they move from your district to my district, I can bill you and you no longer get to keep the money. So there's, it's not as the incentive. 
I thought that was always kind of in there. It just wasn't being utilized. Uh, that's true. I think it's been in there longer than people started and then started utilizing it. But in the pe long ago, I don't know how long ago, it, well, you couldn't do it. But then there was a period you could do it and districts weren't implementing it, but districts are implementing it now. So there's less of an incentive to do that, but for a while there really was an incentive. Thank you. Dr. Z, please. Yeah, I guess I'm, I want to make sure I have a right understanding. When we adopt a policy, um, it seems to me that we are setting forth a contract. And schools that violate the contract then, um, uh, it seems to me then uh, um, parents uh, expect certain policies to be followed and then they're not. If their child suffers a conceivable injury or loss, well then you've got the grounds for tort. Uh, and um, if you can show the school is in violation of the state policy in a, in a given instance, it seems to me then you've got the, you know, the, you've got the setup for a financial penalty, but that has to be mounted by an individual who suffered a loss who, who can make, make the case. Um, is that my is my understanding of the of, of how these things work together correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, we've reached uh, a conclusion. Then we'll break an hour for lunch. It's now what eleven fifteen. We'll come back at twelve fifteen. Well, but I mean, we've announced that one o'clock will be public comment. So right. We just move stuff. We'll up. just move stuff okay. up. Thank you. So we'll adjourn from eleven fifteen to twelve fifteen for lunch. <laughs>